Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. When people write letters praising the commercials on a radio program, that's news. Well, it's happened scores of times to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. People say the commercials on this Equitable Society program are packed with helpful information. Give them an entirely new slant on life insurance. Tonight's Equitable commercial is no exception. Tonight, in just 14 minutes, you're going to hear about a type of insurance that's important to 50 million Americans, most of whom know practically nothing about it. Be sure to listen carefully to this message on group insurance from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, The Trail of Terror. In the early days of the nation... The West was considered to be the gathering place for every lawbreaker who was evading the police of his native state. It is true that in those days there were whole cities made up of fugitive criminals. Bad men rode the plains and committed untold havoc among the early pioneer settlers. Life was rugged, and the only, only the very strongest were able to survive. But today, things are different. Today, in every western state, you find evidence that life is not much different than it is in the east. For people are basically the same wherever they live. Most of them are decent, law-abiding citizens. But some, well, some of them are throwbacks to the old west. The west that grew up to the constant noise of gunfire. The old west, where few men met death naturally. Tonight's file opens on a lonely, gutted road winding through the flatlands of one of our western states. It is early evening as Clint and Charlotte Williams drive their ancient jalopy along the road toward their new home. Clint. Yeah, honey? Look at that sky. Yeah. That's really a sunset. It's so beautiful. Uh-huh. And with no Empire State Building getting in the way. Clint, you miss New York? I should say not. The only thing I missed was you. I know that feeling. I'm glad I come out here ahead of you, though. There was a lot of work to do around the place. And now it's ready for us. I don't know how you ever got a long way out here by yourself. Oh, it wasn't too bad. Anytime I got stuck, I went back to my Boy Scout handbook and found the answer. <laughs> oh, that's the truth. In the first week, I practically lived out of that handbook. <laughs> well, baby, it's just about time for you to close your eyes. We're coming close? Just over this little hill. Okay, they're closed. One thing now, Charlotte. I don't want you to be expecting too much. It's still just a shack, you know. It won't compare with Clint, some... Please be quiet. Let me form my own opinion. Okay. Let's have that opinion. Oh, 
Glenn, it's lovely. You, you like it, honest? Oh, it's wonderful. Hey, is that our dog? Uh-huh. His name is Slap. He came with a place. Will, is me a nice fella? Okay, Slap. Hey, down, boy. Down. That's a fella. Hey, get down. Glenn, this is everything I hoped it would be. It's different from Washington Heights, huh? Oh, see, yes. You know something funny? When I was a kid on the west side, I was all the time nuts for playing cowboy. Now look at me. Boots, blue jeans, ten-gallon hat. I'm the real McCoy. So is everything around here. Clint, let's go inside, huh? Sure, baby. Hey, you want to slide out on this side? Uh-huh. That's it. Thank you, partner. <laughs> You're mighty welcome, ma'am. <laughs> hey, have you got any cows on this ranch? Sure. That's him. Oh. Over there in a the barn. <gasps> oh, Clint. Yeah, wait a minute. I'll get out my key. You don't need a key. The door's open. Now, that's funny. I thought I locked it. Well, honey, we just walk right in. Go ahead. Okay. Well, how do you like it? Hey. What's the matter, dear? I didn't leave those dirty dishes there. I didn't open those cans. Are you sure? Well, of course. I spent all day yesterday cleaning this place up before I went in for you. Hey, Charlotte, somebody must have broken in. Oh, Wait here, I'm going to look in the bedroom. Oh, wait, Clint. No, no, you stay right there. Well? Nobody in there. The bed was slept in, though. Huh? Somebody broke in and stayed here last night. more coffee, Clint? No, thanks, baby. Oh, brother, what a dinner. Did you have enough? Did I have enough? Three helpings of everything. I'm up to here. Well, I think I'll do the dishes. No, no, sit down and relax. We got all night. Well, I'd rather do them. What's that? Coyote. They're, they're kind of dangerous, aren't they? No, they stay up in the hills. They don't bother anybody. Do they yell like that much? Well, they... Look, baby, I'll tell you what. Let's turn on a radio and get a little music, huh? I don't mind their yelling. Look, what with the house being broken into and all that, you've had enough things to make you jumpy. Yeah, this will make you feel like you're right back in Washington Heights. Oh, Clint, I, I don't want you to think I'm a sissy. Oh, stop that kind of talk. Yeah. How's that, huh? No. Hey, did I ever show you this picture of me? My mother mailed it out to me last week. It's awful cute. That's when I was uh, one of the Eagle Scouts of the Daniel Boone Troop. We used to all the time go on hikes. New York? Sure, Van Cortland Park. Way over to Jersey, to the Palisades. You know something? I never got lost once. Oh? Yeah, I was the best trail marker in the troops. We interrupt this program to broadcast a warning. Three men held up the Maywood Bank on Tuesday afternoon. One of the bandits has been captured, but the other two, who are armed are still at large in this vicinity. All roads have been blocked off. And... Oh, that's enough of that. Clint, do you suppose they're the same ones? What do you mean? The ones who broke into this house. Of course not. But the man said they were in this neighborhood. Baby, this is a wide open spaces. Why, this neighborhood is hundreds of miles. What's that? It's the dog, Slack. Well, what's he barking for? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Wait, I'm coming with you. You're not going out there alone. Do you need a light? Not with this moon. He stopped barking. Yeah. Where is he? I don't know. Black! Black! Here, boy! Maybe he chased something. Maybe he ran up. Oh, it's Glenn! What is it? Look here. Oh. He's dead. Isn't he, Clint? Yeah. Somebody hit him with a club. Meanwhile, in the nearby city of Grantsville, FBI Special Agent Taylor has just entered the office of Sheriff Nash. Sheriff, I'm out here looking for the man who held up the bank at Maywood three days ago. Oh, yes. I've just been handed a report on that. You see, I've been up at the state capitol on business all week. Well, then let me give you a personal report on it. Well, go right ahead. Well, it was a three-man job. They pulled it in broad daylight. Now, how much did they get? About $16,000. Yeah, a lot of money. The sheriff at Maywood was in the bank at the time of the robbery. 
He wounded one of the bandits, but they made their getaway in two cars. Mm -hmm. Now, one car ran out of gas about, oh, 30 miles down the road from here at the B Bar H Ranch. Well, that's Tom Jenkins' place. Yes, that's it. Well, the two bandits in that car slugged one of Mr. Jenkins' hired hands, stole two horses, and rode off. And leave any trail? No, no, none at all. Well, what happened to the other fellow? Oh, he was the one who was wounded. I guess he couldn't keep going with that wound because he drove his car off into a ditch. Oh, where? About five miles down the road. Mm. My guess is that this is where he was going to rendezvous with his partners. Well, what happened to him? One of your men is uh, with him over at the hospital now. They picked him up. <laughs> you can see I just got back. I don't know what's going on in my own office. <laughs> I understand, Sheriff. Oh, uh, here's a description of the other two robbers. I wish you'd post some notices on them. Yeah, you bet I will. You got anything else on either of them? Well, I got some prints on one of them from the car they abandoned. I've already sent them on to our identification division down in Washington. Good. Well, I'll have these wanted notices made up at once. told you to stay in the house. Well, I just came out to shoot a couple of rabbits. You can't go rabbit shooting this time of night. I come out early. Why didn't you go back? I did. When I got back, there were people in the house. A man and a girl. Who are they? I don't know. They see you? No. But that dog of theirs jumped me. What'd you do? I killed him. Oh. How did you make out in town? Did you see Foster? No, he never showed. I waited at the saloon as long as I could. Yeah. You think he might have got picked up? I don't know. He was hurt bad from that shot. Maybe he's dead. Hmm. What do we do now? Nothing. Just keep moving. Where's your horse? Oh, uh, right over there in back of that barn. Okay, go get him. Let's get out of here. Oh, we can't go. Why not? We've got to go back to the house first. What do you want to go back there for? The money from the bank job is still in the bedroom. <laughs> Did you find out anything in town? Yeah, I sure wish we'd gotten these wanted notices out a little sooner. Oh, why? One of these fellas was in the Parker House Saloon all afternoon. Oh, we must have been right then about Grantville being the place they were going to use for a rendezvous. Yes. When he left, he told the bartender that if his friend showed up, to tell him he couldn't wait. He gave the bartender a description of his friend. Oh, have you got it? Yeah. It's that fella Foster we got in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Did he uh, tell the bartender anything else? No, just said he couldn't wait, went out, got on his horse and rode away. Well, if he's traveling by horse, he couldn't have gotten very far. Uh, uh, excuse me. But, uh... Sheriff Nash. Yes, yes, he's here. Just a minute. For you, Taylor. Oh, thanks. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, hello, Fred. You have? Fine, go ahead. Andy Morton. Hmm? Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Fred, thanks very much. I'll be in touch with the office as soon as I get anything. Bye. That was, that was our office, Sheriff. They've gotten an answer from Washington on the prints out of the single fingerprint file. The prints belong to a thief named Randy Morton. Well, I've heard of him. Oh, he's got a long record. Uh, he usually works with his brother, Les. Mm, that might help. Know who we're looking for. Sheriff, both Morton and his brother are known killers. You'd better warn all of your men to keep their guns handy. Mm, I'll do that. Well, what should we do next? Well, if you've got enough men, why don't you fan out and try to cover the neighborhood? We know they're around here someplace. Okay. Where are you going? I'm going over to the hospital and check on whether or not I can talk to the wounded bandit. That's the house right up there. Yeah, I know. I'll see if the horse is here. Okay. <coughs> What is Step this? back, mister. It's a gun I got here. Please. Quiet, lady. Hey, you Keep those hands up. up. All right, frisk him, Wes. Right. Clint, who are these men? I don't know. He ain't carrying nothing. What are you doing here? We left the package. Where is it, Les? Under the mattress in that room. See if it's still there. Right. What were you doing in this house? We slept here last night. 
You're the ones who killed my dog. You asked too many questions. Clint, I know who they are. They're the ones the radio was telling about. They held up that bank. That's right. You'll never get away with this. Every road is blocked off. The radio said so. I got the money. You hear that, Les? What? She says every road is blocked off. She claims we'll never get through. Oh? Uh-huh. Shall I tie him up? No. They're going to help us. Hmm? Oh. They got a car. They're going to drive us through that roadblock. I won't do it. Shut up! <laughs> All right, now listen to me, both of you. Do you want to drive us through the roadblock and live? Or do we kill both of you right here? Well, come on, answer it. We'll drive you through. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Now, a 50-second interview on group insurance with a young mother from Gary, Indiana. Mrs. Morris, keeping house and taking care of those three youngsters must keep you pretty busy these days. Certainly does, Mr. Keating. It's a full-time job. So believe me, I'm mighty glad I didn't have to go back to my old position when my husband passed on last year. Oh, your husband had enough life insurance so you can afford to stay home? Well, we could only afford a little. What made the big difference was group insurance for the Equitable Society. That changed the picture, did it? Oh, yes. It's being paid at the rate of $50 every month. And those $50 checks will go on until my youngest child is 16 years old. So with the group insurance, plus what I get from Social Security, my children have a full-time mother. Yes, group insurance with the Equitable Society was a mighty good thing for you, Mrs. Morris. And it's just as good for your husband's company. For three good reasons. First, it means satisfied, loyal workers. Think of getting life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and retirement income, plus hospital, surgical, and medical benefits, all in one package from the Equitable Society. And no medical examination either. Second, group insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society decreases labor turnover. My husband said a man thinks twice before he walks out on a job which gives him extra insurance coverage at far lower cost than he could buy it on his own. Third, Equitable Society group insurance improves quality and quantity of production. Getting rid of all those worries about sickness and accidents just naturally helps anyone do better work. Well, I hope every employer in this radio audience hears what you said and that every one of them is resolving now to get the facts on complete group insurance protection from an Equitable Society expert. Get in touch with the nearest office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or write direct to the New York Home Office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file... The Trail of Terror. It is a general rule that criminals have no compassion. Because by the very nature of their illegal deeds, they declare themselves to be outcasts and not regular members of any society. They feel that they owe nothing to anyone, but that the world in general owes them a living, a living which they mean to take in any way they can. And so their treatment of fellow human beings who happen to get in their way, treatment which shocks and outrages every decent citizen, is a part of the criminal's regular pattern of behavior. Life to him is cheap, another person's life, that is. And he'll allow no such weakness as a qualm of conscience to stand between him and the one thing he values, his freedom. The night file continues as Special Agent Jim Taylor arrives in front of the young couple's home to meet Sheriff Nash. Hello, Sheriff. One of your men called me at the hospital said that you found the two horses that were stolen down at the B-Bar H Ranch. That's right. Found them tied up right up the hill. Huh? Yes, you get work. anything over at the hospital? No, Foster died a couple of minutes after I got there. Oh, too bad. He might have helped us. Whose house is that, Sheriff? A young fellow named Williams came out from New York about a month ago. Oh, what do you know about him? Not much. He was in the army. Bought this place. One of those government loans. I see. He uh, live alone? No, no. I understand his wife came out from New York just today. Mm-hmm. Did Williams have a car? Yeah, but it's gone. Have you got any description of it? Yes, one of my deputies gave me one. I'm going to send it out. Good. Let's hope they haven't gotten through the roadblock as yet. We've got a double block, then. Fine. 
While you're sending out that alarm, I think I'll go inside and take a look around the house. Try to stop crying, baby. We'll get out of it, okay? Let's have a little less noise up front. Can I even talk to her? You just wait a minute. Up. What? Them lights up there on the road must be a roadblock. Slow down, kid. Oh, thank heaven. This ain't doing you any good, lady. You're gonna duck under these blankets back here. And I don't need to tell you, you two better give the man the right answers. Baby, we gotta do like he says. Evening. We're looking for a pair of men on horseback. You see anything of them? No, sir. How far you been riding? Oh, just this side of Grantville. That's where they were earlier tonight. You been on the highway right along? Yes, sir. Well, I don't think they could have got past here. But if you see anything of two men on horseback, you just go to the nearest phone and call the sheriff. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll do that. All right. Go ahead. Nice work, kid. Where do we go now? There's a fork in the road up ahead. Turn to the left. When are you letting us go? I ain't made up my mind about that yet. That you, Sheriff? Yes, and I got bad news. Oh, what's that? We sent out that alarm a little too late. I got through the first block? Ten minutes ago. Too bad we didn't find those horses a little earlier. You find anything in here? Yes. William's wife did arrive just tonight. Her bags are in the bedroom, still unpacked. Oh, I spoke to that deputy of mine who knew the Williams boy. And? He don't think Williams was working with the Mortons. I know they weren't. Here. Look at this picture of Williams as a youngster. No one about it. Well, that's a boy scout uniform he's wearing. And he left these three matches on top of the picture. What does that mean? Well, three of anything is a boy scout signal of danger. You see, I used to be a scout myself. Well, if they ain't working with the Mortons, those youngsters are in real danger. Mortons had just soon kill him as none. How far is that second roadblock from the first? We're not very far. And have you notified them that the Mortons are in a car and not on horseback? Well, one of my men is doing that over the radio in my car now. Good. Now, if they got through the first block, then they must be traveling on the highway. That's right. Is there any pass we could cut through and maybe head them off? Yeah, yeah, there is. Cold Rock Canyon cuts right down to the pa- uh, highway there. I think we'd better make a try at it that way, then. Come on, Sheriff, let's go. <laughs> This road ain't as smooth as the highway, but it'll get us there quicker. Well, that's all we're looking for right now. We'll pick up about half an hour going this way. It might be enough to save a couple of lives. I sure hope so. Newton to car number one. Oh, that's us. Oh. Go ahead, Newton. More bad news, Sheriff. The Williams car got through the second roadblock. How'd that happen? There was a girl driving the car, and Harrison was looking for three men. After they got past, he got the second alarm, but they were gone. All right. We're headed down toward the highway now. They keep going, we'll head right into them. We'll be in touch with you later. How do you feel, Charlotte? I'm okay. I'll see if they'll let me drive again. Just stay where you are. But, gee... We ain't going much further. We're stopping at the next crossroads. Well, what are we stopping for, Andy? This car's getting too hot. You mean we start walking? No, there's a place down here by Water Tower where every train stops. Yeah? There's one due to stop in about a half an hour. It'll pick up water, then go to Chicago. Uh, We're going to be on it. There's a crossroad up ahead. Yeah, slow down. Uh, what are we going to do with them? I don't know yet. We can't let them go. They'll run to the cops. We ain't going to let them go. When we leave the car, we'll take care of them. Sheriff, there's the highway now, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's it. Here we are. Sheriff, look. There's a car parked over there. It looks like the Williams Come car. Come on, let's take a look. It is the Williams car. They're in it. Are they dead? No. No, they're still breathing. Oh, good. They're both unconscious. What do you suppose made the Mortons get out here? I don't know. Come on, let's see if we can find any trail. It's pretty dark to be looking for footprints. 
water's still hot. That means they must have been here not more than a couple of minutes ago. We couldn't have missed them by more than that. I think Wait we... a minute, Sheriff. Come here. Flash your light on the front window of the car there, will you? Uh, that one? That's it. Didn't your deputy report that Mrs. Williams was driving when they went through that second roadblock? Yeah, that's right. That means that Williams was sitting in this right-hand seat. Well, I guess so. Why? Look what's drawn in the dust on that window. A long vertical line with short cross lines and a heart upside down. Yeah. Sheriff, radio your deputies to pick up these youngsters and get them to a doctor. I think I know where we can find the Morton brothers. train coming in, Randy. Should have been here by now. Must be running late. Well, maybe we should have... Wait a minute. Yeah. There she comes now. Hmm. You think it'll stop? Sure. It's got to have water, don't it? Does it? Look, Les, I've run things pretty good so far, haven't I? Not good enough, Morton. Huh? Throw those hands up. Go on, both of you. Who are you, a railroad cop? Oh. I'm from the FBI. What? All right, Sheriff. Throw the cuffs on them. It'll be a downright pleasure. Then let's get back to town. Pretty late for an old Boy Scout like me to be up. Randy Morton and his brother Les were tried and convicted in a federal court on the charge of bank robbery. They were sentenced to serve 20 years in a federal prison. And so, because a special agent of your FBI remembered his old boy scout signals, two dangerous bank robbers were caught. Clint Williams, riding beside his wife, had written two signals into the dust on the window of his car. Special Agent Taylor put those two together and went directly to the water tower by the railroad track, with the results you have already witnessed. After the conviction of the two Morton brothers, the Williams were given a reward for their part in the capture. And your FBI was able to stamp a familiar word on still another file. The word, closed. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, some more useful facts on Equitable Society Group Insurance. It's a bargain for workers because it enables the company to give its employees the benefit of its wholesale purchasing power. It's a bargain for the management because it builds loyalty and goodwill, decreases personnel turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. No wonder Mr. S.C. Allen, president of the National Cash Register Company, says group protection is a mutual undertaking with mutual benefits. As such... This company has and will continue to profit from its share in this outstanding welfare plan. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your group program is incomplete, get in touch immediately with the nearest office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, This Is Your FBI will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a case involving America's number one crime problem. Its subject, juvenile delinquency. Its title, The Indifferent Mother. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis, your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Indifferent Mother on This Is Your FBI.
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. On tonight's program, it is our pleasure to present Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who will speak to you from Washington, D.C., We have stated that this program is presented by the Equitable Life Assurance Society as a public service. This applies not only to the program itself, but to the commercials. All Equitable Society messages are designed to be of service to you, to point out ways and means by which you can give greater security to your loved ones, to keep you informed on present-day developments in insurance. For instance, tonight's Equitable Society message is on a type of insurance which touches the lives of 50 million Americans. Yet most of the 50 million know little or nothing about it. So it will pay you in just 14 minutes to listen to the message on group insurance from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, The Indifferent Mother. Every law enforcement agency in the nation is faced with many seemingly eternal problems. And when, as sometimes happens, those problems appear in pairs, then the path to a solution becomes that much more difficult. Juvenile delinquency, always a major problem, has recently become entwined with one of America's most serious crimes, auto theft. In a recent study made by your FBI of the field of crime during the first six months of this year, one figure stood out. That figure was the total value of automobiles stolen during those six months. And that figure was more than $31 million. The night's file opens in an apartment located in one of the residential sections of an eastern city. Alice Roberts, a slim, pretty, teenage girl, is just entering her mother's bedroom. Hi, Mom. Hello, Alice. Hey, what are you getting all dressed up for? Are you going out? Yes, please don't bother me now, dear. But, Mama, will you... Alice, stop stammering, dear. What do you want? Well, I... I was just hoping you'd be home tonight to help me with my dress. What dress? My costume. Darling, will you stop talking in riddles? What costume? The costume I'm wearing in the school play tomorrow. Oh. Is that tomorrow? Well, yes. Oh, Mother, don't tell me you're not coming. Why, I'll stop. Now, Alice, don't be dramatic. But, Mother... I have a date to go to a matinee tomorrow with Mrs. Williams. But you can always see a matinee. But tomorrow's the only time we're giving the school play. Now, Alice, Mrs. Williams would be very offended if I called at the last minute. But you knew about the school play a month ago. Well, I... I'm sorry, darling. I just <laughs> forgot about it. Oh, now, don't start that, Alice. Oh, Mother, please listen to me. Everybody else's parents will be there. You've got to come. You just got Alice. to. Now, how do I look? Huh? I asked you, how do I look? Oh, well, you look okay. Oh, thank you, dear. Well, I've got to be going. You'd better let me sleep late in the morning, dear. I'll be home quite late tonight. Oh, good luck tomorrow, darling, with your play. <laughs> That ain't the reason. You got the same trouble I have. What do you mean? Your mother didn't show up. Mine didn't either. Isn't that it? She didn't even send any flowers. Oh, look, honey, what do you care? Don't you? I don't pay any attention to those things anymore. I'm used to them. But 
Well, don't you feel funny when your own mother doesn't care enough to show up? Well, it used to bother me, but why ride with it now? My mother lives her life, I live mine. You want to do the same thing. I don't understand, Flo. Well, it's simple. You're a pretty girl, like me. Lots of fellows would like to go out with you. My mother doesn't let me go out. Is she going to be home tonight? No. She's got a date to go someplace to a party. Well, that's fine. Then why don't you come home with me for dinner? I got a date tonight. I'll have him get a friend for you. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just greeting Ned Hamilton, a policeman attached to the local force. Now, pull up a chair, Ned. Oh, thanks, Jim. Hey, uh, congratulations on winning that pistol shooting contest. You beat some pretty good shots. Oh, thanks. I've got a problem, Jim, that calls for something more than being a good shot. Oh, what's your trouble? Do you know how many automobiles are stolen every day in this town? Well, I know it's quite a few. Well, there's a new angle on it now. Oh, what's that? Young kids are stealing some of them. Oh, but that's always happened, Ned. Mm, not this way, Jim. In the old days, any car stolen by a kid would be used for a joyride and then abandoned. Yeah, that's right. These cars are disappearing. What? I've got a list here of motor and serial numbers on cars that have been stolen and haven't turned up anywhere. Well, then they must be selling them someplace, Ned. But who'd buy a car from a kid? I wish I knew. That's what I came up to see you about. You think there's an FBI violation someplace? Yes. You see, we picked up one of the kids who stole a car. Get anything from him? Not much. He's only 16, but he's got that misguided notion about honor among thieves, so he wouldn't talk. What about his parents, Ned? Have you spoken to them? Mm-hmm. They asked us to keep the kid in jail. It's a nice attitude. To make the story even nicer, the kid was drunk when he was picked up. Why could a kid that age get whiskey in this town? He didn't. He got it out at Aunt Clara's. Aunt Clara? Who's that? Well, she runs a juke joint across the state line. That's why I can't touch her. Oh, but I know that high school kids from all over the town go out there, and the place is one of the biggest contributors to juvenile delinquency that we have. That name, Aunt Clara, is very deceptive. So is she. I'd like to see that place. I, uh, I wish you would, Jim. Just run out and take a look for yourself. Okay, I think I will. Well, where's that list of serial numbers on the stolen cars? Oh, there you are, Jim. Thanks. I'll send out an alarm on these at once. Aunt Clara. Hello there, son. Come on over. Hi, Aunt Clara. Hello, Ricky boy. Sit down. Sit down. Thanks. How about a nice big slice of homemade pie? Made with Aunt Clara's own loving hands. I, I ain't hungry, thanks. Well, what's on your mind, Ricky boy? Well, I got a date tonight. That's nice. Anybody I know? Yeah, Flo Duncan. Is that the little blonde you had out here Sunday night? Yeah, that's the one. Say, she's real cute. Yeah, I think so, too. Rick! Kids over in booth four want more beer. Keep your eyes open, boy. Aunt Clara. Yes, sir. I, I kind of got the shorts. I need some cash, about fifty. <laughs> That's a nice number. Can I have it? From me? Yeah. Now, Ricky boy, your account is overdrawn. Well, I can't be. You haven't turned in a car in a month. You've given a lot of parties since then. But Aunt Clara, I told you I got a date. What time is your date? I'm picking Flo up in front of her house at 8.30. Well, it's only 6.30 now. Look, Ricky, why don't you be a smart young boy? You've got two hours. Go into town and steal yourself another car. Received word at headquarters you wanted to see me. That's right, Ned. We got pretty quick action on that list of stolen cars that you gave us. Oh, what have you got? Well, the Cleveland office made a raid yesterday and broke up a big stolen car ring that was operating out of there. One of the cars they found in the garage was on your list. Well, any idea how they got the car to Cleveland? No, none so far, but the Cleveland office is working on that. And from what they teletyped to us, it's indicated the ring got cars from local agents all over the country. Then they changed the car's numbers and sold it. That's it. Hmm. Oh, Jim, did you get out to Aunt Clara's? Yes, 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 I did. I just looked around, though. The place was teeming with kids, and all of them drinking quite heavily. Did you see anything that tied in with the stolen cars? No, no, I didn't. But if this Aunt Clara is tied in with that racket, she's going to be a difficult one to trip up. Yeah, I know. Ned, it'll probably take the Cleveland office a couple of weeks to go through all of the papers they seized when they made that raid. So my suggestion is we keep our eyes open at this end. Okay. As soon as you get word in the next car that's reported stolen, we'll go to work. Okay, okay, we're coming. Hi, Ricky. Hi. Hope you weren't 
waiting long. We didn't finish dinner Who's until... Who's she? Huh? Oh, this is a girlfriend of mine, Alice Roberts. Alice, this is Ricky Hill. Very happy to meet you. Hi. Get in, huh? Okay, you get in first, Alice. Wait a minute, she's coming? Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. I thought maybe you could get a date for her. Can you, Rick? Well... Look, Flo, I really don't care to force myself. Get in, there'll be guys fighting over you before the night's over. Flo... Not Aunt Clara's. Oh, swell. Is that the place on the old mill road? Yeah, a very sophisticated place. Flo, does he have to drive this fast? Well, don't worry about Rick's driving. He's very conservative. Yeah, but... Oh, quit beefing, will you? Sorry. Where'd you dig her up? Oh, we go to school together. We were in the school play. Uh-huh. I have a program of the play right here if you'd like to see it. I'm driving. Well, you might know some of the kids Rick, are... do you hear that? Uh-huh. It's a motorcycle, Cyrus. Yeah, it's a cop. Well, he's after us, Rick. We're not going to stop. Oh, Rick, don't be foolish. He's bound to catch us. Not when I open this thing up. Oh, don't make him stop. I can't. This ain't my car. Oh, Rick, whose is it? I don't know. I, I stole it. What? Oh, oh, Rick, he's pulling alongside. You've got to stop. Oh, no, I don't. Oh, Rick. Oh, you, you hit him. How else could I get away? Oh, you can't leave him there. Shut up. We're going to Aunt Clara's. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Now a 50-second interview on group insurance with a man who's recently had a lot of sickness in his family. Isn't that so, Sam? Sure is, Mr. Keating. Within six months, my kids had mumps and measles. Then my wife caught pneumonia... And all the rest of us came down with the flu. Oh, that was tough going, Sam. I'll bet you owe a mint of money to your doctor. No, sir. I don't owe Doc Smalley one red cent. Where I work, we've got complete group insurance with the Equitable Society. And that even covers medical expenses for you and your family? You bet it does. Well, we had 20 visits from Doc Smalley, not counting the times we went to his office. But checks from the Equitable Society paid the Doc faster than he's ever been paid before. Yes, group insurance with the Equitable Society was a mighty good thing for you, Sam. And it's just as good for your company for three good reasons. First, it means satisfied, loyal workers. Yeah. Think of getting life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and retirement income, plus hospital, surgical, and medical benefits, all in one package from the Equitable Society, without any medical examination. Second, group insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society decreases labor turnover. All right. A fellow thinks twice before he walks out on a job which gives him extra insurance coverage at far lower cost than he could buy it as an individual. Third, Equitable Society group insurance improves quality and quantity of production. Believe me, I do better work now that I've got rid of all those worries about sickness and accidents and my wife and kids' future. Well, I hope every employer in this radio audience hears what you've said and that every one of them is resolving now to get the facts on complete group insurance protection from an Equitable Society expert. Get in touch with the nearest office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or write direct to the New York home office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Indifferent Mother. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI gradually illustrates how easy it is for the most innocent youngster to get into trouble. How very important it is that every child be given as much parental guidance as possible. Because without that guidance, without that pillar to lean on, any young boy or girl can easily become involved in any one of a series of major crimes. Children don't just grow. They must be helped. And in helping them, you help fight the greatest problem American law enforcement officers face today. The problem of juvenile delinquency. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor is studying a later report from the Cleveland field office about the stolen car gang when the telephone rings. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Oh, hello, Jim. Ned Hamilton. Oh, hello, Ned. I'm down at the city hospital. Hey, what happened to you? Oh, nothing. I came down here to get some information from a patient. Uh, well, who's that? One of our motorcycle patrolmen was chasing a car out on the old post road tonight. As he 
boat alongside, the car swerved and knocked him into a ditch. What happened to him? Broken leg and severe contusions. But he's conscious. I, I just spoke to him. Hmm. He got the license number of the car, and I checked it. Stolen? Yes. It was being driven by a young boy. There were three kids in the car, and he recognized one of them, a the young girl. Oh, who was she? She was a girl who sang in a school play out at Washington High School this afternoon. The patrolman saw the play because his daughter was in it, too. What was the girl's name who was in the car? Alice Roberts. Mm-hmm. Have you sent an alarm on the car yet? Yes, just before I called you. Well. well whoever the kid was, he stole a car he can go a long way with. The man who owns it had just put four brand new tires on it less than a half hour before it was stolen. Ned, did you get an address on this Roberts girl? Yes, she lives at uh, 410 North Adams Street. 410 North Adams. I'll go out there right now. And, Ned, when I finish, I'll meet you at the hospital. <laughs> Clara, you got a minute? I've got to see you. You are, Ricky boy. What's on your mind? We had an accident. What kind of an accident? I was coming out here with a heap and a cop started to chase me. Did you shake him off? Better than that. What do you mean? He was on a motorcycle. I let him get alongside him and then I swerved and he went into a ditch. Well, what did you do with the car? I drove it into the basement downstairs. Ricky boy, are you crazy? You want to get everybody thrown into jail? What do you want me to do? Stop and get picked up? I want some protection. Where's your girl? She's down in the car, and there's another girl with us. What'll I do? Get back downstairs and wait for me. All right, Alice, I'm coming. Oh. Hello. I thought it was my daughter. She's always losing her key. Are you Mrs. Roberts? Yes, that's right. My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Oh. Here are my credentials. The FBI? What do you want here? It's about your daughter, Alice. Alice? Where is she? I don't know where she is, Mrs. Roberts. That's why I came here. What's happened to her? She was seen tonight riding in a stolen car along the old post road. In a... St- oh, that can't be true, Mr. Taylor. She's in the school play at Washington High School tonight. That school play was held this afternoon. It was? Yes. It's odd. I, I was sure it was tonight. Mrs. Roberts, did she say where she was going tonight? Well, I didn't ask her. I, I haven't the faintest idea. Well, can you give me the name of some of her close friends? They might know. Well, I I don't really know any of Alice's friends. Mm-hmm. Well, then can you tell me where your daughter likes to go when she goes out? Why, I... Well, how would I know? Well, girls usually tell their mothers about things like that. Yes, but Especially I... if the mothers show any interest. Oh, I... Oh, my poor baby. It's a little late for that, Mrs. Roberts. However, if you'll try to help me, we'll do everything we can to find her. I want to go home. Oh, look, Alice, we'll be going home soon. But I want to go home now. You'll go home when we do. Rick, don't you talk to her that way. I'll talk to her any way I like. Stand the chatter. Here comes Aunt Clara. Well, what are you doing, Ricky boy, robbing the cradle? Look, Flo is all... I mean the other one. What's she crying for, her mother? No, she felt sorry for the cop on the motorcycle and wants to call the police. It serves you right, Ricky boy. I've told you a dozen times. It's always better to work alone. Well, I did the job alone. I picked them up after. You should have delivered the car before you picked them up. Well, it's too late for that now. What'll I do next? What do you do with us? Please, dear. One thing at a time. Rick, the first thing to do is to get rid of the car. Okay. Now put the girls in my office and we'll lock them in while you're gone. Right. And don't go near the garage with that car. It's too hot. Just take it out on the road someplace and leave it. And when you come back, I'll let you know what I've decided about the girls. <laughs> Sorry I made you wait this long. Yeah, that's okay, Jim. I just finished talking to the patrolman's doctor. Uh-huh. Oh, I went out and saw that girl's mother. Could she give you any help? No, not a bit. You know, I can understand why her daughter is out with the kind of company she's keeping. She's just letting that girl grow up by herself. Yeah, I know the type. One thing puzzles me, though. I spoke to the patrolman's daughter after I spoke to you. She swore this Alice Roberts is a fine girl. Yeah, well, she is with that kind of a mother. It's a miracle. Oh, have you spoken to your office since you talked to me? Yes, I called him just before I came down to meet you. Yeah? 
They uh, found the car that the motorcycle patrolman was chasing. They did? Where? About five miles the other side of the state line. Did you get the exact location? Yes, I did. Well, come on, Ned. I'd like to take a look at that car. Find anything inside the car, Jim? Just this program from the show that was given at Washington High School this afternoon. Oh. It uh, has Alice Roberts' name on it. Well, it proves she was in the car, all right. Yeah. Well, the car wasn't left here too long ago, either. The motor's still worn. Any fingerprints inside? None that are good enough to help us. Well, I guess this dent here is where the motorcycle hit. Yes, it's fresh dent. The scratches are still clean. Well, at least we're getting a little closer to whoever did the job. We couldn't have missed him by very much. Matt, how about the state trooper who found the car? Did he give you anything? No, I was just talking to him. He didn't see anybody around here. How'd he happen to be on a dirt road like this? Well, the farmer who owns that field saw the car and called the state police barracks. Oh, I see. The trooper made a complete inspection of the ground and followed a set of man's footprints up the dirt road, but he lost them when they reached the concrete highway. A set of man's footprints? Is that all? Yeah. Why? Well, that means he must have dropped the girls off someplace before he decided to get rid of the car. Yeah, that's right, Jim. Come on, let's take a look around the outside of the car. I only went over the inside. Uh, let's use your flashlight, too, huh? Okay. Ed. What? There we go. Yeah. Look down here. Oh, what is it? Didn't you tell me that these were brand new tires that the owner had just put on the car this afternoon? That's right. Now, you see those little bits of blue stone that are caught in the tire? Yeah. What about them? They could lead us to that missing trio. Rick? Yeah? Oh, look, when are we getting out of here? I don't know. Little Aunt Clara comes down. She's running the show. I want to go home. Oh, quit that, will you? Hey, Arthur, Rick. Look, all she's done is beep and cry about wanting to go home. I want to go home, too. I don't like this any better than she does. Since when? Since you hit the cop. I like to have fun, but I didn't know you were stealing cars. So now you know. Yes, and I also know enough never to go out with you again. Well, Ricky boy, you got rid of the car, huh? Uh-huh. Look, we want to get out of here. You're getting out of here. You're letting them go? No, but I'm getting rid of them. What do you mean? You girls are taking a little trip. And I think we should get ready for it right now. Uh, Ricky boy, I'll need your help. Okay. What is this? Well, you're going away, that's all. And I have something here that should make you sleep through the whole journey. Hold her first, Ricky. No. No, keep away from me. Shut up. Let go of me. Leave her alone, both of you. Who are you? Special agent of the FBI. Oh, thank huh? you. What are you doing here? I think that's obvious. Well, how did you know we were here? The car that was abandoned tonight had blue stones stuck in the tires. I remembered that the driveway here was covered with blue stones. Ricky, can you please take us home now? Well, there's a policeman upstairs who will take you home. I'm going to drive Aunt Clara here and a young friend down to jail. The woman known as Aunt Clara was tried, convicted, and given a 10-year sentence for violation of the Motor Vehicle Theft Act. Her young accomplice, Ricky Hill, was sentenced to a reformatory until he reaches majority. And now, This Is Your FBI brings you a message on juvenile delinquency from the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The next voice you hear will be that of Mr. J. Edgar Hoover speaking to you from Washington, D.C. My message tonight is directed to the mothers and fathers of America, to all adult citizens responsible for the welfare of our youth. During the war years, when age 17 was leading all other age groups in frequency of arrests, the volume of juvenile delinquency in the United States reached an all-time high. It was disheartening to see thousands of our youngsters caught in the backwash of war. But I had hopes then that the condition was temporary that after the war, the factors that contributed to delinquency would be removed and corrected. That apparently was wishful thinking. There was an encouraging decline in youthful delinquency immediately after the war. But arrests of youngsters are again on the increase. During the first nine months of 1947, arrests of boys 18 to 20 years of age increased nearly 27%, 
over the same period in 1946. Moreover, some of the wartime teenage offenders have grown up, and many are now committing more serious crimes. With a major crime occurring every 18 seconds, it is time to pause and examine the problem. I have noted that there is something lacking in the home life of most youngsters who violate the law. Even the delinquents, who are from apparently normal homes, are victims of parental neglect. The parents are either too careless or too busy with their own pleasures to give sufficient time, companionship, and interest to their children. I am convinced that a parent's gravest responsibility is to understand his children and win their confidence. Many fine, law-abiding parents actually do not know what their children are doing or how they spend their leisure time. When they find out, it is often too late. Their remorse does not remove the shame which their negligence has caused. Boys and girls are not hard to please. A little attention given to their problems and pleasure can mean so much. They violate the conventions of society because they are unhappy because they feel insecure, and because they have not had the love and sympathy due them. Hence, my message is for the parents. Are you, the parents of our young people, doing everything in your power to develop your boys and girls into good citizens? Do you know your sons and daughters? Do you have their confidence? Are you acquainted with their friends? And do you know how they spend their leisure time? If you do not, I suggest that you take inventory and do what is necessary to make your home a place of learning as well as a place of living. A little more attention given to your child today may save the beginning of a life of degradation tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Hoover, for your telling and forthright message. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now some more useful facts on Equitable Society Group Insurance. It's a bargain for workers because it enables the company to give its employees the benefit of its wholesale purchasing power. It's a bargain for the management because it builds loyalty and goodwill, decreases personnel turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. For instance, the president of the Colgate Palmolive Peat Company, Mr. E.H. Little, says, Colgate Palmolive Peat Company, together with its employees, has recognized the advantages of group insurance protection. We believe that certain basic group plans are an important feature of a well-balanced industrial relations program. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your group program is incomplete, get in touch immediately with the nearest office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The colorful story of a cross-country quest for a stolen fortune. Its subject, bond theft. Its title, Lady Luck's Husband. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time. For this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. If you have a friend who is a representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society, maybe this phone conversation will sound familiar to you. Hello? This is your Equitable Society representative. I just called up to remind you to listen to This Is Your FBI Tonight. 
the Equitable Society has some good news for you in the middle commercial. What news is that? There's a new edition just off the press of the Equitable Society's famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. That's the chart that made such a big hit with members of this audience last year. So be sure to listen to the middle commercial to learn how to get your copy of the Equitable Society's new fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file, Lady Luck's Husband. It is a regrettable but true fact that many decent, hard-working citizens hear or read about the current crime wave and regard it as something which only remotely concerns them. They are wrong. And if you believe that the crime wave does not directly affect you, then you are wrong, too. In the first six months of this year, thieves in the United States stole property worth almost $60 million, an average of well over $2 million a week. That property was not stolen from any special class of people, but from everyone in every strata of our society. More than one theft was committed every second of every hour around the clock, day and night. And the thing to remember is that for every theft, there was a victim. A victim who might just as easily have been you. Tonight's file opens in a gambling house located in a suburb in one of our large eastern cities. The owner, a lean, hard-looking, gray-haired man, is standing near the entrance and watching the various tables as a woman approaches. Where have you been? At the bar. I told you to lay off the grog, didn't I? I only had two drinks. Our, uh, boy is here. I know. I got the office from Charlie. Which one is he? The guy in the gray suit, standing next to Harry. I see him. You remember everything I told you? Don't worry about it. Here. Here's some chips. Go over and bet with him. Whatever he bets. There's only 200 here. You won't need any more. He's going to win tonight. Okay. See you later. Yeah. Good luck. Five and a two. Pay the come and take the line. Next shooter. I'll shoot 50. 50 is right. And make your plays. Here he comes. Six and a one, natural. Pay the line. Now let it ride. I'll stay with him. Keep lucky, mister. Coming out. E-11. Pay the line. Keep those dice hot. I'm shooting a hundred. And another hundred with him. Two and a four. Six is the point. Twenty and a hard six. Bet me twenty the same way. Here he comes. It's a three and a three. Hard six. Pay the line. Pay the hard six. Make your bet. Same man shooting. You're my lucky man. Yeah, you ain't doing bad for me either. Make your bets. All right, make your bet. Shoot another hundred. How about you, honey? I'll go. Uh-oh. I've got to quit. Uh, what's the matter? I have to duck somebody. Still your dice, now, wait a minute. Come I don't want to lose you. You're too lucky. Well, then cash in my chips for me and meet me later at the bar. Hey, over here. Oh, sorry I kept you waiting, honey. I had to finish my shoot. How'd you make out? Oh, I went about a G. Well, not bad. Yeah, here's your dough. Six hundred. Say, thanks. Can I buy you another drink? Sure. What is that, scotch? Mm, and water. Hey, Joe, two scotch and water, huh? Yes, sir. I'm sorry I had to run out on you like that. But did you have to? Yes. Why? Oh, I spotted a fellow coming in. Friend of my husband's. Your husband? Uh-huh. You see, he doesn't want me to gamble, so I have to sneak out and come here alone. He must be daffy. If I was married to anybody as lucky as you, I'd drive you to the game. Well, uh, I'm not usually so lucky. Maybe it was me? It was. Why don't you just say we're a good combination? Okay. One that ought to stay in business. Is uh, that an invitation? Well, now that you bring it up? Yeah. But I'm a married woman. Well, you're with me now. Well, big, strong type fellow. No. No, it's like rolling dice. I pick my spots. Mm, I see. Hey, I don't even know your name. It's Hazel. 
Well, I'm Bill. How are you, Bill? Hi. Hey, look, uh, I got an idea. What? Where'd you tell your husband you were going tonight? To, to the theater with a girlfriend. You got any more excuses like that? That depends. What do you mean? I'm like you. I pick my spots. Well, how about picking a spot to meet me tomorrow night? No, look. We'll listen to music instead of dice. What do you say? Well, okay. Meanwhile, in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk when Special Agent Frank Brady enters. Oh, Frank, pull up a chair. Thanks, Jim. Hey, congratulations on the baby. Oh, that's right. I haven't seen you since then. <laughs> How's Evelyn? Fine, Jim. She and the baby came home from the hospital this morning. Oh? No sleep at night for you for the next couple of months. <laughs> I've been thinking about that. <laughs> I hope there isn't too much night work on this new case. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. But what's it about, Jim? I, all I know is that the boss assigned me to work with you. It's a bond job, Frank. Huh? $88,000 worth of negotiable securities were stolen two weeks ago in Los Angeles. Oh, and they uh, think the bandits are back here? No. No, the Los Angeles office arrested the bandits the day after the job. Well, I don't get it. What are we supposed to do? Find the bonds. Oh, I see. The L.A. office got a tip that the bonds were sent east right after the robbery. They, uh, they don't know how, do they? No. No, but my guess is they were sent by messenger. Now, have we got the records on the two bandits who were arrested? Yes. Yes, I've gone over them three times now, but I haven't been able to find any link that they had with anybody here in the east. Well, did either one of them have any family back here? Uh-huh. No, not according to the records. What do you think our first move ought to be, Jim? Well, I guess the only thing we can do right now is send out an alarm on the bonds, Frank. I've got all the serial numbers right here. I'll get up a list of security officers here in the city. Fine. And we'll follow up the circular with some phone calls. Check with me as soon as your list is ready, Frank, and we'll go to work. Hazel, throw me a match, will you? Hmm? Oh, sure. Here. Thanks. Oh. Jack, you look tired. I am. I was up all night. Again? Yeah, the tables ran late. We let the suckers play till six o'clock. <laughs> Lucky I've got a boyfriend to take me out. Hmm. How are you doing with him? Not bad. We had another date last night. That's three, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, three. You got another day tonight? Mm-hmm. I'm meeting him at seven. Hmm. How nice for you. <laughs> How nice for him. You think you got him on the hook? Mm, well, all I can tell you is, last night the way he talked, you'd have thought I was the original dream girl. Hmm. You like that, huh? Sure. Why not? Did you tell him you were married? Uh-huh. Have you given him the husband routine yet? Uh -huh. You mean that he doesn't understand me? Yeah. Have you used it? Not yet. You uh, kind of like this assignment, don't you? Jealous, baby? No, baby. I'm just reminding you. This is a business deal you're swinging. Look, why do you need this guy so bad? I already told you we need somebody to crack a safe. Why well, couldn't we hire him? We'd have to cut the job down the middle. This way, we get it for free. Oh. Honey. Huh? You've had enough fun with this guy. Tonight, I want you to go to work. Sorry I'm late, Jim. I was on the phone with Evelyn. Oh. Baby's been sick. Oh, really? What's wrong? The doctor says there's nothing serious. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, it's quite a relief. He cried all night. Oh, well, you'll get used to that. Yeah, so I understand. Uh, has anything come in on the alarm, Jim? No, not a word so far. But we did get a teletype this morning from the Los Angeles office. About the bonds? Yes. One of the men who committed the robbery decided to change his plea to guilty. Oh, that's good. Did you tell the whole story? Yeah, just about. Including the location of the bonds? He says they sent the bonds back here with a messenger. Well, that's what you guessed, Jim. Who was the messenger? A young hoodlum they gave $50 in expenses to. Pretty cheap for transporting that kind of loot. Well, it seems the messenger didn't know what he was carrying. I see. Who'd he bring the bonds to? A fence named Tom Reynolds. Tom Reynolds? Mm. Don't I know that name? Sure, sure you do. He's got a record that runs two pages long. A big, heavy set man with a, a small mustache? That's the guy. And now we know what our next step is. 
Let's see if we can find Tom Reynolds. Hazel? Yes, honey? Now, what's the matter with you tonight? What do you mean, Bill? No chatter, no smiles. You want to dance? Hmm. No, baby. I got other things on my mind. Trouble? Well, I... Oh, spill it. Maybe I can help you. Come on, talk. Well, I left my husband. Oh? I couldn't stand his nagging another day. Well, that kind of a guy, huh? Yeah. Now, what was the final rule about Mm, well, it's a long story. The main thing was he always complaining about my spending too much money. I understand. That's a pretty common beef with husbands. He had no right to use it. It's my own money I was spending. You mean really yours? Yes. Well, you should feel happy to be rid of the guy. I would, but for one thing. Oh, what's that? Oh, it's a personal matter. Oh, what is it? Maybe I can straighten it out for you. Well... I had $88,000 worth of bonds, my bonds, in my husband's safe at home. And when I left, he wouldn't let me take them. Why not? He said if he kept them, it would make me come back. Are you going back? Not if I get the bonds away from him. And if you don't? Well, then I'll have to go back. I haven't got anything else to live on. How do you feel about the guy? How do you think? You think you'd like to stay away from him? You're so right. How do you feel about me? You should know by now, Bill. I'm really hooked. Honest? Honest. Look, baby, you never did tell me where you live. I'm staying at the Central Hotel. I don't mean now. Where did you live before with your husband? 28 Mapleton Drive. Honey, we're getting out of here. Why? I'm taking you back to your hotel. Then I got a little trip to make. Where to? Your house, honey. To get those bonds. <laughs> Jack? Yeah? You all through work? Yeah, yeah. Not much business tonight. We closed early. Oh. Say, so what are you doing here? I thought you had a big date. I had it already. Oh, how'd it go? Fine. Uh, did he go over to Tom's to get the bonds? Yeah, an hour ago. Is he coming back here with them? Oh, just as soon as he gets them. Ha ha! Swell, swell. It worked out real good. You know something, Jack? Uh, what? I almost hated to do it. What? What are you talking about? Well, the boy really had a big yen for me. So? It's going to be real disillusioned. <laughs> now, ain't that too bad? I mean it. Look. Look, you ain't running a Lonely Hearts Club. This guy's coming up here any minute with 88 thou worth of bonds, and we're getting them free. Yes, Forget but... it, forget it. Now, uh, you know what to do when he gets here. Yeah. Just have him leave the bonds and say you'll see him tomorrow. Mm, I know. Oh, oh, that must be him now. Get in the other room. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, uh, just a minute. Uh, hello. Is this uh, apartment 407? Uh, well, that's right. The man said to bring this package here. You sign it, please? Oh, surely. Uh, there you are. Thanks. Uh, Jack. Yeah, yeah. Who was it? Delivery boy. He brought this. Oh, looks like flowers. Uh, who are they from? Uh, well, wait till I get it open. There. Hey, there's a note. Oh, wait a minute. I'll read it. What's it say? Uh, dear Hazel, many thanks, sweetheart, to you and your real husband for tipping me off where the bonds were. Your loving sucker, Bill. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI promotes security for the nation. Now let's bring this question of security closer to home. Ed, can you see the title of this chart I'm holding in my hand? Yes, it reads a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Right, a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers prepared by the Equitable Society. Okay, facts don't scare me. What's this chart all about, anyway? Ed, it's designed to open your eyes to your family's financial needs if you should die. Fill in this fact-finding chart, and you'll know how much money it would take to keep your wife and children well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed. Have you ever faced that fact, Ed? I'm ashamed to say I haven't. It'd be quite a job to figure all that out. Ed, with this Equitable Society chart, you'll have the answer in five minutes flat. Look, you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures, which illustrate the rock-bottom expenses your family will have to meet. 
And when you've finished, you'll have a clear, accurate, and complete picture of just what income your family would need during the critical years. Critical years? What are they? The years before your youngest child finishes high school. Years during which the home must have a minimum income to keep it together. I see your point. Where do I get one of these fact-finding charts? And how much does it cost? Why, it doesn't cost a cent. The Equitable Society representative in your community will be glad to bring you a copy. Sit down with him, you and your wife together. There's no obligation, and get a true picture of where you stand. Phone him tomorrow to bring you an equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard care of this ABC station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Lady Luck's Husband. The history of the world since time began is studded with crimes. For even in the very earliest days, some men were so overcome with greed and lust that they became the first criminals. From that day on, up to and including this very minute, some men have devoted their time and their very lives to planning and committing the perfect crime. In tonight's case from the files of your FBI, you see another example of a pair of criminals who tried the same thing with the same inevitable result. Someday... Man will give up that evil dream of committing that perfect crime. But from all appearances, that day will not come soon. Tonight's file continues in the local FBI field office as Jim Taylor has just returned from a trip to the home of Tom Reynolds. Well, Jim, was that the right Tom Reynolds? Yes, Frank, it was. Did he have the bonds? I don't know. What do you mean? He was on the floor, unconscious, when I got there. How'd you get in? The front door was open. I guess whoever knocked Reynolds out left it that way. Well, where's Reynolds now? He's at Memorial Hospital. They came and took him away while I was there. Hmm. Did he ever regain consciousness? No, no, he didn't. Any lead on who knocked him out? Well, maybe. I worked up a set of prints that I found on his wall safe and on a strong box that was laying open on the table. I sent them on to the ident division in Washington. Well, it looks like somebody else knew Reynolds had those bonds. Whoever did must have had a pretty good grapevine because the bonds couldn't have gotten to town more than a couple of days ago. I guess word spreads fast on a deal like that. Yeah, apparently it does. What do we do now, Jim? Frank, I think the best thing to do is go home and get a couple hours sleep. We won't get a report on those prints until morning. <laughs> Is that you, Jack? It ain't your boyfriend with the bonds. Oh, stop beefing, will you? Go out and get those bonds for me and I'll stop. Wasn't my fault we got double-crossed. Didn't I ask you to stay right with the guy when he did the job, didn't I? Yes, you did, but I thought it was better this way. Ah, uh, every time you do any thinking, we get into trouble. Did I pick him out and say he was a sucker? No, that was your idea. The whole thing, the whole thing was set up for you, and if you stayed with him, we'd have the bonds. Look... You once told me, don't cry about losing a bet. That's right. You said, just worry about winning the next one. Well, we blew a bet. You blew it, not me. All right, all right, I blew it. But we're in this thing together. Let's try to figure out how we can win the next bet. Ah, that's a cinch. All we got to do is find Bill Newton. I was just over to the place where he used to live. Used to live? Yeah, yeah, the janitor told me he blew with all his bags. There must be some way to find out where he went. <sighs> I called every guy in the mob. If he shows up any place, they're going to call me. Well, let's stop worrying, then. He's got Wait a... a minute. Huh? Do me a favor, will you? What? Throw out those flowers. Frank. Oh, Frank. Hi, Jim. I came right over as soon as I got your message. What's going on? We received a report from Washington on those fingerprints that I found at Reynolds' house. They were identified as belonging to a thief named Bill Newton. Ah. I checked, and I found that he lives in this building. Good. No, not so good. He's gone. Oh? Huh? Yeah, I checked out early this morning. See. I have a pass key here to his apartment, though. Come on. Any idea where he went? No. No, I talked to the superintendent. He couldn't give me anything on him. But he did have one piece of information. What's that? He said there was a thin, gray-haired man around here about two hours ago, also looking for Newton. Who could that be? I don't know. Oh, here's the elevator. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, 
Press number four, will you? Right. You know, whoever that gray-haired man was, it was pretty important to him to find Newton. Why did he say that? He offered the superintendent $1,000 if he could remember where Newton was headed for when he left him. Sounds like the gray-haired man knew about the bonds. Yeah. No, he's up for Go ahead. Thanks. It's the last door on the left-hand side. You know, if we get lucky and find a lead, maybe we can catch Newton before he leaves town. Hello? Hello, Hazel. Anybody call me? No. No, where are you? At the joint. Oh. You coming home? Oh, uh, later. Should I get dressed for dinner? We going out? I don't know. Right now, I'm not interested in dinner. Did you hear anything about Newton? No, nobody's seen him. Well, he must be someplace. I know that. I mean, he's got to turn up sooner or later. Uh, if he turns up later, he's no good to me. I need him now. But, Jack... Uh, hold the phone a minute, honey. There's a guy trying to talk to me. Where is Harry? What is it? When? Oh, thanks, pal. Thanks. Hazel, Hazel, listen. How soon can you get our bags packed? Why? I just spoke to Harry Marshall. He saw Bill today. Where? At the airport. He was getting on a plane for Miami. So pack your bags and I'll pick you up in ten minutes. How are you doing in here, Frank? Not very well, Jim. Anything in that closet? No. Looks like Newton had time to pack all of his suits. Mm-hmm. Anything in these papers in the wastebasket? No, I've been through those, Jim. Oh. The only thing he left here is an overcoat. Oh. Well, that could mean he's headed someplace where he doesn't need one. Unless he left it here to throw us off. No, I don't think he's that smart. Besides, he didn't know we were looking for him. That's true. Did you find anything? No, the laundry hamper in the bathroom is full of soiled monogram shirts, handkerchiefs. And there's a laundry box full of clean shirts, also monogrammed, delivered after Newton had skipped. Well, those monograms fit in with what it said in his record, remember? Oh, yes. Yes, very fancy dresser. Well, Frank, I think we'd better go back down to the office if we can work up some of the lead. Okay. There's nothing here except the shirts and that lot. Hey, wait a minute. What? Huh? I think I just thought of something. What? Let's go back in there and look over that laundry. What number are we looking for? 1027. Come on, come on. It's down this way. Are you sure he's in? Honey, I didn't give that bell captain 20 bucks for nothing. This I'm going to enjoy. When I think how he can't... Quiet, quiet. That's the room there. Who's there? Telegram, Mr. Newton. Step back, sucker. Well, this is a surprise. Listen, you... Lay off. I'll do the talking. What do you want? Take a guess. If it's the bonds, I haven't got them. Don't make jokes. I'm not in the mood. I'm telling you, I haven't got them. Look, son. You ever seen one of these? In case you haven't, it's a gun. Yeah, and that little thing on the end is a silencer. It don't make any noise at all when it goes off. You want me to show you? No, never mind. Where are the bonds? In the top drawer over there. I'll get Stay them. where you are. Hazel, take a look. Okay. Well? I'm looking. In the right-hand corner. Did you hear that? Yeah. Yeah, I've got him. Good, good. Here you are, Jack. Now, the next time, stick to your own racket, Newton. Just crack safes. Don't try to outsmart anybody. Come on, let's get out of here. Wait a minute. I'm not finished. But, Jack, We you... can't leave the chump like this. Now, look, you got your bonds, didn't you? That ain't enough. What do you mean? I'll show you. Drop that gun. Huh? Go on, drop it. I turn around slowly. Who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. What do you want with us? Those bonds? We don't know anything about them. She's right. They belong to this guy. He's lying there, hers. Suppose you tell all this to the real owner in federal court. Now, come along, all of you. Jack Mayfield and Bill Newton were tried and given a 15-year sentence for violation of the National Stolen Property Act. Jack's wife, Hazel, received a five-year sentence for her part in the crime.
And so three more criminal careers were brought to a close because of the alert observation of a special agent of your FBI. A special agent who remembered that every piece of laundry he had examined had borne the same label. He also reasoned that if Bill Newton was a fastidious dresser, it was likely he would order his new supply of shirts from the same man who had made his old ones. A check at the store revealed that Newton had called before taking the plane and had ordered his new shirt sent to him at the hotel in Miami. That was not a big clue, nor even a seemingly important one. But every special agent is trained to follow every clue, big or small, to its conclusion. For that reason, your FBI was able to close this case and once again to protect you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, one last word about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Mr. Keating, I've been looking over that chart. My wife and I have been dodging this issue for years. Now we're really going to know how she and the youngsters would get along if anything should happen to me. Believe me, I want one of those charts for myself. Well, Ed, the man who'll see that you get one of these fact-finding charts is your Equitable Society representative. No charge or obligation, of course. Make a note to phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this ABC station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The story of a special agent's search for Santa Claus. Its subject, the Christmas season. Its title, The Return of St. Nick. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The return of St. Nick on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.